everybody. Cheers, man. Pretty sweet turnout. Thanks very much, everyone, for coming out tonight. Uh, didn't expect so many people, to be honest. So it's really, really nice to see that there's a bit of a scene in, a, in Adelaide for this at the moment. Um, OK, so as uh, was just discussed, I'm, I'm an engineer. My name's Ross. This is my big bro, Nick. Um, he's an architect. There's actually three brothers, um, and the other brother's also an architect. So um, I guess you could say buildings and engineering's really in our veins. Um, I guess a few things. We're just a couple of guys. We're not international experts on the topic. We're just a couple of guys that have uh, want to share some of our experiences on how over the past 10 years we've been trying to push the limits in this topic, I guess. Um, we both live and breathe uh, this philosophy. And um, yeah, I guess we're just humbly giving it a crack. So we're not telling you how it's supposed to be or how you're supposed to live or how you're supposed to do things. We just want to share with you what we've learned along the way. Um, and the other thing is that, yes, Nick is an architect. I'm an engineer. And yes, we did almost kill each other a few times putting this presentation <laughs> together. <laughs> But um, there's a weird mix, OK? So it's, you know, it does bounce between Nick talking about architecture and me talking about sustainability. And sometimes it may be confusing, but hopefully it all makes sense at the end. So uh, thanks a lot, guys. Nick will now uh, explain what the whole thing's about. Hi, guys. How are you? Sorry, can you hear me OK? <clears throat> so um, the reality of self-sufficiency in the Australian city has arrived, but it's missing a culture to create it. Today, there is only one thing stopping us from making self-sufficient cities a reality. Surprisingly, it's not technology or finance, nor is its governments or businesses. It is its inhabitants. Let's explore what is arguably an inevitable future for our cities and communities by discussing how the transformation will create a culture, but more importantly, how culture will create the transformation. OK, so Tess asked us to put a synopsis together. And that was our synopsis. Hopefully it didn't bore you guys and it wasn't too fluffy. Um, basically, can we slide? What we're trying to say is that self-sufficiency in cities is inevitable. Okay, It's not a question of uh, if, it's a question of when. Okay, Slide. Uh, the transformation to self-sufficient cities from where we are now to where we're going to be is going to create an amazing atmosphere. It's going to create culture and it's going to create vibe. The, the, the most interesting thing from my point of view is that you can only create that transformation if you have the culture to create it. Okay, So this is what we're playing with tonight. This is what we want to discuss. Slide. Who are these dudes? Um, so we're going to quickly tell you a little bit about ourselves. Um, and we're going to start from the start, basically. <laughs> Slide. Uh, so yeah, I mean, uh, I said we're not experts. And it just sounded cool to say from bros to pros. <laughs> but um, I guess we're, we're going to start with talking about from you know us, who we are in our background. We went through a bit of an experimentation phase, and we'll talk to you about that, where we try to get outside of the fishbowl and dabble with a few unusual things. And then how our experience have consolidated back to how we're actually trying to transform this into something that's real. Slide. From bros to pros. Slide. <laughs> Let's start from the start. This is mum and dad. Mum, mum was one of the top 10 models in Australia in the 70s. Um, she was too nervous to come along tonight to support us, so she didn't make it. But Dad's in the back. Put your hand up, old boy. <laughs> yeah. Woo! So, so Mum was a bit of a peace-loving hippie. Dad was a badass engineer, one of the best engineers in Australia, actually. And um, I guess that kind of defines who we are as people, OK? We're both brothers that are obsessed with architecture and engineering. Um, but we do love the environment, and we do want to protect it for future generations. Slide. So we were brainwashed into architecture and art as kids. From before we could choose what color our shoes were, we were forced to go see Mies van der Rohe, Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, Corbusier, and you know this this pattern followed on through our lives. This is what we believed in. And this is just what we was life for us. So slide. Now Nick's going to quickly tell you a little bit about his. Uh, Formative years. I'll let you take it away, Nick. So um, life in architecture started for me at um, the City West campus. 
Um, I actually spent my summer holidays working for Guy Moron um, while the City West uh, site was actually being built and um, then the next year returned to start studies. The campus was confrontingly um, uh, not engaging and people really weren't happy to be there. And it was a huge uh, learning experience for me into um, how, well, how not to design public architecture. And then <laughs> moving forward 10 years, I had the good fortune of um, being employed by John and coming back to UniSA to then work on the last, um, well, one of the last buildings in the campus, um, the Hawke Building, um, which was um, an equally interesting process, but um, also taught me that buildings are, um, bu well, buildings can engage the community, but they can't do everything. There's more to, them, uh, there's more to um, the community than just architecture. Slide. Um, big part of um, my life and learning about, um, I suppose, um, well, Nick, Nick was a really good DJ. <laughs> Nick was like one of Adelaide's best DJs at one point in time. I spent many a dance floor moment cheering my brother on. So I, I travelled the world looking for um, great musical experiences and realised that there's a lot you can learn from that. Slide. Um, arriving in Melbourne, um, working for John, I worked on amazing civic projects and residential projects but realised that um, John was very, very good at engaging people on an urban scale and um, learned a lot from that slide. Um, going to one of his other projects, Doc 5, it's a, it was a beautiful architectural project, but it was at the end of the day um, just a building. And what you see on the right hand side there is the Docklands. And what I learned from this project is that you can't just design great architecture and assume that it's going to um, create a vibe. Um, activate a place. So Docklands, um, they, they developed it and then they thought about the community afterwards, whereas what I really learned from that project is you need to think about establishing a community before you, you, know, you develop the site. Slide. So after leaving John, um, started my own practice and really learned that the reality of small, small practice, uh, small budgets, small projects and um, really wanted to get to the bottom of exactly how to design projects that um, were experientially um, exciting and how you engage people through design. Um, so long story short, did mechanical engineering and finance in Adelaide, uh, skipped off to Sweden for a year to focus in on sustainable energy engineering because the University of Adelaide didn't do shit on renewable energy at the time, to be perfectly honest. Um, Came back, got a job with this guy, Che Wall. Um, he was the founder of the World Green Building Council, the founder of the Australian Green Building Council. And basically the coolest thing was he was just really well hooked up. He had just had amazing projects going on all over the place. Slide. So basically um, I was following these projects as a kid and then I got to work on them, which was really exciting for me at the time. So some of them were amazing like this, a naturally ventilated train station in Melbourne, which was, you know, they designed the fans out of needing, it, needing fans in there. A train can burn on fire and it doesn't even need a fan to exhaust it, basically. Slide. To other buildings that um, I did the energy monitoring on this project and let's just say it didn't perform quite as well as people hoped it would. And so sometimes, this was a really like kind of disheartening experience for me, just that it was claimed the greenest building in the world and it wasn't so green in the end, okay? So um, not everything that looks green is green and this was a big moment for me um, in my professional career. Slide. And then I'm sitting there, 22, um, it, this was in the Sydney office, and I heard a whisper of a 250,000 square metre master plan coming into the office with Jean Nouvel, the most famous fr French architect, um, and um, Norman Foster. And I just went straight up to my boss and I was like, man, I have to be in on this, my ass is yours, but I want this project big time. So, um, yeah, I basically just chained myself to a desk with this guy for two years and we just looked into every single thing that we possibly could to push the limits on this. So energy, water, waste, self-sufficiency was our goal and we just pushed it to the limits. So, so this is what they ended up building. 
we, we, I, I knew this project inside out, 400 megabyte spreadsheet, I had a 3D model, I knew hour by hour, every energy use, every water use, every waste, where waste was gonna be produced. We proved to them that you could power the whole site using only renewable energy with a 10 year payback period, okay? We proved that it could be water neutral and we proved that you could make it zero waste. Um, so basically the thing that happened there was that um, they, we got to 60% reduction in carbon, okay? We got, we, we, we got to 100% water neutral and 80% reduction in waste and I was pissed off. I was, I was not happy because I just, I thought if I prove a technical and financial solution, why wouldn't it be, why wouldn't it happen? Why, why would someone not do that if they can make money out of it? Why wouldn't you do it? So this was a big sort of learning moment for me. Um, so that's basically, um, this was, I then got moved to London, okay? to work on, um, or this was one of the projects we worked on. We told the architects not to install the wind turbines. It got voted the ugliest building of London that year, actually. Um, we told them not to install the wind turbines. They installed the wind turbines. The wind turbines don't spin, okay? So <laughs> I was like, what is going on with all this stuff? You know, there's, there's, there's barriers that are beyond me as a, as a person who's consulting people technically and financially. That, that I, can't, I can't control, and I didn't like that. I thought it was limiting, so slide. So I, was, I thought, it, I felt like people were missing the point, okay? I mean, from you know, rating tools to climate change to carbon, it just didn't, no one really had one uniting opinion on what it was about. And for me, there was a moment that clicked and I just thought, it's not about sort of avoiding carbon, it's not about uh, climate change, and it's not about avoiding problems. The, the whole world is basically 81% powered by resources that are finite. And when you consume a resource that's, that's finite, you end up with finite byproducts. Those finite byproducts create environmental damage. And the goal was to get onto the infinite stuff, okay? So I started to explore it a bit more. Slide. Looked into it, um, got, I got into this sort of green MBA course and they basically gave me mentors to help me work out how to try and solve this problem. And I looked into it and they taught me this way of thinking. It's like problems are either, they, there's barriers and they have to either be technical, financial, political or social. That was what they taught me. So um, looked into each of them, studied the technical financial side, felt that wasn't the problem. Um, don't really believe in politics personally. I feel like that, you know, I, I'm not someone who feels that politics ever made a massive impact in the world of recent. And I feel like actually people and business drive it quite often. So in the end, the conclusion I came to, and the winner was, slide, social. So basically, what was kind of the, the, the conclusion was that um, if you want to try and power the whole world using only renewable energy, you need to influence people, okay? So I started to think about this. How does this, how does this work? How do you actually make this stuff happen? So it was worth looking at a quick history of energy in the world, okay? 200 years ago, there was no electricity, okay? There was the, the first industrial revolution comes about. Slide. Um, it's, it's basically the invention of the um, steam engine, okay? It creates train travel, it creates electricity, and it also, the interesting thing is it's a connection between energy and communications. It, it basically, it was, it was a revolution. It changed the way the world works, but it was because they could print books at a rate that was faster than any other rate that they could do it. Before that, it, it, it was way too slow. So, so this connection between energy and communications changed the world, okay? Then, then 100 years ago, invention of the internal combustion engine, okay? Brings on the car, brings on the road, brings on the telephone pole, brings on telecommunications, okay? Completely changes the world as we know it once again. Right now, we're just at the cusp of the third industrial revolution, okay? And this is the way, it's a, it's a, the, one of the main financial advisors to Rifkin, to, to the states is a guy called Jeremy Rifkin. Um, and he basically is the guy who talks about all this stuff. So I'd, it's the combination of renewable energy and internet technologies, okay? So we're talking community renewable energy projects, we're talking crowdfunding. This is all this stuff that's just about to totally blow out of the water and it's gonna flip the world over very quickly. Everyone's always telling me that renewable energy is too expensive, and I think it's pretty funny. Basically, if you look at finite resources, coal, oil, gas, um, even uranium, they're finite resources. They're, 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 they're 
as you consume them, they become less and less abundant. As, as time goes by, they become more and more expensive. It's pretty straightforward. Then, um, infinite resources is dependent on technology. Okay, and technology, we all see it's getting better and better. Okay, and so the exciting thing is that we're at this equilibrium point right now where all renewable energy is, is basically becoming completely cost effective with any old school, archaic form of energy that we're currently using. Unfortunately, governments and all kinds of organisations are still subsidising the, the old school stuff and we're investing in the past and we're not investing in the future. Okay, pretty much you got 40 years of oil, 65 years of gas, uh, 85 years of uranium, and 130 years of coal, okay? That 81% of the world is powered on resources that will run out in two lifetimes, okay? And that's, that's BP, that's uh, uh, International Energy Agency's numbers, okay? I'm not just pulling them out. The, the thing is that it's, whether it's two lifetimes or four lifetimes, it's, it's not a question of if, it's a question of when. It's, it's inevitable that this transition is going to happen. Then you've got to think, okay, yeah, what does that mean? How much energy do you actually need to power the world using the renewable stuff? Um, that's how much, actually. So that little speckle is the area that you require on Morocco of solar energy that you would, uh, to power all of Germany, the DE. Uh, Europe would be that little square. And the whole world, you need basically the area of Texas with solar panels to power the whole world, okay? So it's like totally not so far-fetched. So time to experiment, time to play with this idea of what you do with sort of uh, experimenting with people and how this relates to cities and how you actually transition cities to be self-sufficient. So got into some weird quirky stuff. Basically converted a Mercedes-Benz to run on vegetable oil, did a road trip, through solar powered parties in London to uh, get people basically, empower people, okay? No one, everyone wants to do something, no one knows what to do. So we basically thought throw a party, raise some money for a renewable energy project in Africa. Slide, um, bought a ticket on a cargo, cargo ship, bought a camera, moved to Mexico, started throwing parties over there, worked on a, the world's biggest energy efficiency campaign ever, 23 million light bulbs in six months. Um, in parallel, Nick's throwing solar powered parties with me in Melbourne, okay? It, the interesting thing is that you get people at a solar powered party and they actually come up to you and they say, wow, man, the music sounds so much better when it comes from the sun. <laughs> and, and this is what we wanted to play with, okay? It's like there's an X factor that we needed to try and mess with because this, th that's the barrier that we wanted to break. So, yeah, everyone was having a pretty good time. Um, okay, so then somehow bump into the CEO of a company called Design Hotels, um, crazy German dude hanging out on the beach with him in Mexico. He asked me to do his corporate social responsibility strategy, um, which was really cool actually. It was, you've basically got a company called Design Hotels. They represent a whole bunch of hotels, okay? You've got the hotels, they don't provide a sustainable service, and then you have the, the hotel guests who don't want a sustainable service, okay? So actually there's no real room for sustainability in the whole mix. But Design Hotels, it, it's a German company. They want to be ahead of the game, okay? So we came up with a strategy to, to inspire consumers to want a more sustainable service, and we came up with a strategy to basically help the hotels provide a more sustainable service. Um, so this is a good mate of mine. We started road tripping around Europe, making films about people, okay? We tried to bring it back to people, not about technology, not about you know, solar panels and batteries and stuff like this. This is, you know, I mean, pretty amazing people. One of the guys is a Norwegian billionaire who converted his Ferrari to run on bioethanol. Another guy is like Brad Pitt's personal advisor to sustainability. One of the dudes from Guggenheim, Ari Wiseman's in there. Um, the three Michelin star chef. The, we, we interviewed some really amazing people, created some content to try and inspire people to want this stuff. Not because they had to, but because they could, okay? And, and also, it w wasn't about telling people the way it should be. It was about communicating things that uh, are actually happening right now. This is Klaus, CEO of Design Hotels. Uh, he actually, so we won an award, um, most original campaign, limited edition Miami. Got some street cred from a whole bunch of fancy guys standing around a pool in Miami, like Andre Balash, the guy who runs Standard Hotels. So the cool thing about this was that people seemed to give a shit about a topic that we thought they didn't care about. And this is 
not in a, you know, the, the exciting part was that it was in a non-sustainability zone. This was in like the luxury world, which we thought would never work, and it did. Um, seems a bit random, got to meet Julian Assange. The, 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 the interesting thing with this was that he, he, so uh, yeah, long story short, got to do an interview with him, but it, it basically what he, I hung out with him for two years and we talked about how to create a self-sufficient world, basically, and I was interested in his opinion on the topic. The, the main thing that he told me that I thought was, it, that was my main takeaway was that you have to influence the influencers. And you know, he said to me, um, I, with WikiLeaks, for example, like the guy or not, you know, he, he took down corrupt banks in Iceland. He swayed a vote in Kenya, okay? Like, he's done some pretty amazing stuff. And he said that he needed a certain cool factor and a certain mass behind what he wanted to do. But really, what you had to do to create change was to influence the influencers. So the next day, I accident, like, somehow randomly got a phone call from Vivian Westwood's people. She's this famous fashion designer in London. And they asked me to throw a solar-powered party for them with uh, um, a, a, her renewable energy crowdfunding platform, Trillion Fund. So we got like Paul McCartney's daughter there. We got Kate Moss's husband to come along and DJ. We, you know, we basically tried to infiltrate the fashionista crew in London and get them thinking that music sounds better when it comes from the sun and raising money for renewable energy at the same time. Back to Nick. So Based on the European model, um, we, looked at, uh, we looked at the concept of well, how Europeans um, well embrace the third place. So that's the concept of the place between home and work, um, where, where you go to interact with people that you, you know, is unexpected. So um, next slide. Moving on to one of our projects, Autonomy. We, this is just a retail fashion store. Next slide. As you can see, next slide. So in a um, very small little project, we had an opportunity to... We had a client with a very small budget, um, a demising um, retail industry, and an opportunity to do a great design. So we looked at the opportunity for a, um, a modular construction that could be demountable and taken with us um, and move on to the next store. Um, the opportunity that is probably much more exciting to talk about though is that we were able to insert a little espresso bar in the corner of the retail um, store which activated the entire basement of the shopping centre and started to engage the local um, patrons and also the, the staff that worked in the store or in the centre. So taking that up to um, a much larger scale, this is Spencer Street Station on the right hand side which Ross mentioned before. On the left-hand side is um, the, the derelict and boarded up and abandoned Old Savoy Tavern. Um, it had been sitting there since the 80s as, um, as the Mayor of Melbourne called it a scab on the city. Um, we had the opportunity to um, revitalise an existing building, um, work with the City of Melbourne to uh, reuse an existing building. Um, and just a very, very simple strategy of unpicking and reusing uh, what was ex there existing and, and activate it. And, um, and I suppose take the old tradition of the tavern and instead of it being an internalised space, uh, I suppose connect it with the street and actually uh, connect it with the surrounding uh, precinct and uh, I suppose embrace the concept of the third place. So, okay, so now we come back to, because, I mean, that maybe that was slightly confusing in a way because we kind of keep chopping and changing, okay? But the idea there was that, you know, we're, that was experimenting, okay? That was trying to play with different things that are outside the box. And so it was like, how we, can we connect people with technology? How can we connect people with places? How can we get in the people zone? As engineers and architects who are not supposed to do that. Um, so now after 
professional experience and experimenting, how do we consolidate those ideas to apply them to something that we think is useful? So through the Design Hotels crew, meet some crazy Swiss guy, 99 year lease on the entire mountain in Switzerland. It's a pretty cool project. Um, they're doing lots of cool stuff, okay? Like, like badass ski resort, hydroelectricity, solar panels, Porsche chairlifts, um, electric bikes, hybrid groomers, like you name it, they're pretty much doing as much as you could think of. Um, and yeah, keep on going, yeah. And then they met me and we decided that we'd try and push it to the limits and make the whole mountain self-sufficient. So we basically, if, we pretty much just tried to come up with everything from buildings to energy supply, cost effectively doing it, okay? I, I don't feel like I have enough time to go through all of this and do it justice, okay? But basically the thing is that we're not just talking about throwing technology at stuff, we're talking about finding the most cost effective way that we can make an impact and do it from start to finish, okay? Keep it cruising. Energy supply, okay? So, you know, wind turbines, biogas, but all of these things had a 10 year payback period or less, and that's the main point that we're working with. Um, you can see all that stuff there is the stuff that we focused on, the most cost effective initiatives. Not the crazy small scale wind turbines that weren't doing anything, but we were focusing on you know, the waste wood gasification as they have a huge amount of biomass in the neighborhood. Um, a waste strategy to make it zero waste, to transport strategy, to yeah, keep it cruising. Uh, yeah, like actually food and purchasing as well. Um, for me, this is a really funny one, actually. You've got Swiss Alps, okay? They've got Evian water flowing through the, you know, everywhere. And it's like, you know, in all honesty, you take a shit in the Swiss Alps and you're shitting in four litres of Evian water, okay? It, for me, it's ridiculous. I come from Australia. They're sitting there going, well, but it's cheap, it's free. What do we do it for? It goes through 10 people before it leaves, from when it leaves Switzerland to getting to Amsterdam, okay? And so the thing that's interesting there is that these guys are really interested in taking care of water there as well because it's only a matter of time until water becomes really expensive as well. It's really finite resource once again, okay? So the interesting thing with these guys is that, just hold on a sec, yeah. The, the interesting thing with these guys is that the way that they engaged me, and this is the combination of what we're talking about, the way they engaged me was not just for a technical financial strategy, but they wanted to come up with a cool, crazy way of engaging their staff, engaging their board of directors, because only one of the board of directors actually wanted all this stuff, and they wanted a cool way of getting all the guests on board. Okay, so here's a video that quickly summarizes what that's about. Gotta get yourself 
That's one of the world's first snowboard resorts, okay? So it's kind of, you know, they needed a badass strategy and they wanted it to really suit the, the snowboarders, okay? That's their clientele and they wanted it to fit with them. So that's the way we kind of tried to motivate and inspire people along with that. And there's a whole bunch of other communications that's coming along with that project. Um, as we're running low on time, we've kind of tried to jam way too much stuff in there and I'm kind of getting assassinated from the front over here. But we kind of felt like it, the most important thing for us to do is to end it on a project that we're finally collaborating on. So, so after um, that's, I've been overseas the last five years. I've just recently decided to move back, and for me, this is the kind of exciting part: is that I, I've been basically solo for the last five years. So now I'm collaborating with Adelaide-based Adelaide uh, engineering firm Best Tech. I've, they've asked me to come and set up a sustainability section within their company. Um, and part of that's going to be a rebranding, which is pretty exciting. We're going to get business cards made out of recycled cardboard. Um, but the thing is that the, the exciting thing for me is the, the power behind that, okay, is that, you know, as one dude cruising around trying to high five people and throw parties and make videos, you can only make a certain amount of impact. But like these guys are doing airports, they're doing hospitals, they're doing like, all kinds of amazing big projects. So what we're kind of excited about is like combining to actually build some awesome self-sufficient stuff. Slide. And this is one of our first projects between Ha, Fine Infinity, and Best Tech. Um, and slide. And what it is, is it's in the city of Yarra. It's a quarter of Melbourne, basically. It's 20 square kilometres of Melbourne. Okay, um, slide. Uh, they've got a million tonnes of carbon each year. They've got a lot of buildings, okay? Like, we're talking thousands and thousands of buildings, okay? And we've been commissioned by the city of Yarra to do this, but they don't own any of the buildings. Um, 74,000 people, and that's our goal, is to empower people to create this thing to happen, okay? It's not your normal client. Uh, the interesting thing is the demographics, okay? Is that we're talking 29% of the people in the city of Yarra are between 25 and 34, actually. Um, and so this is basically what we've set forwards as a vision with them. And there's a whole bunch of really interesting projects that we're rolling out with them um, in terms of master plan and how you actually power a quarter of a city using only renewable energy. And we'll leave it there with this because this kind of summarizes it for you. And then if you guys are bored, you can run away. Or if you're interested, you can stick around and keep watching it. Thanks very much, guys. Thank you.